and Carl for the invitation and for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very sad that I cannot be there in person. The program seems uh, very exciting, but I'll do my best to convey the message uh, even from distance. Okay, so I'm going to talk about graph shortcuts and as Nicole said, this is a joint work with my super talented postdoc, uh, Shimon Kogan. Okay, so throughout the next uh, one hour and a half, we are going to really focus on directed graphs. Uh, in directed graphs, an important parameter that we are going to focus on is what we call the diameter, which is measured as the longest U to V shortest path if there exists such a shortest path in the graph. So we only consider edges in the transitive closure in the graph, okay? And among all them, we maximize, we look at the maximum shortest path distance from U to V. So why should we care about the diameter? It turns out that if we consider computation in non-sequential setting, like in the parallel, dynamic, distributed settings, the complexity of the computation depends on the diameter of the graph. Imagine, for example, that we wish to compute single source reachability, then the depth of the computation really depends on this length of the uh, shortest path from directed shortest path from S. So really our goal is to take the graph G and to augment it with few edges from the transitive closure in order to minimize the diameter of this augmented graph. Once we do that, we can then compute the desired computation, say reachability, on this augmented graph. And because the edges are taken from the transitive closure, the answers are going to be exactly the same, but we will enjoy the fact that the diameter of the graph is reduced. Okay, so this kind of motivated the notion of diameter reducing shortcuts back then by Ullman and Anakakis and by Perop, where formally we say that a collection of shortcut edges H is a D shortcut if the addition reduces the diameter of this augmented graph to be at most D. So the main goal in this setting is to optimize this trade-off between the size, the number of edges that we are going to take from the transitive closure, number of shortcut edges, and the diameter that we eventually obtain. Usually in the literature, people looked in two interesting regime. One is the linear regime, where we add the, the number of shortcut edges is linear in the number of nodes, and matching shortcuts where the number of shortcut edges is linear in the number of edges. In both cases, this is cheap. If we just perform the computation on G union H, we still run in the same time as you know running on G, but enjoy the reduced diameter. Okay, so suppose now I just have two seconds to tell you something about shortcuts. This is probably something that worth knowing. The first thing to note is that if we don't care about the size, we can always reduce the diameter of the graph to just diameter of one, by just taking all the edges in the transitive closure. But that means that maybe we need to add quadratic number of edges, okay? So getting one shortcut is easy if we don't care about the size. It is also quite easy, and we are going to see the proof soon, to provide shortcuts of linear size that reduces the diameter to square root n. Back then in the first work by Thorop, he conjectured that it is always possible to compute a linear size shortcut that reduces the diameter to polylog, okay? And that was refuted kind of 10 years after by Essie, who showed that there is a bad graph example for which if you just want to reduce the diameter by just one unit below n to the one over 17, you need to add super linear number of edges. So in the bad graph example of Essie, he provided a graph with m edges, and diameter of n to the one over 17. And if you just want to reduce the diameter of this graph by just one, you need to add a super linear number of edges, which refutes the conjecture by Sol. Okay, so here is a more detailed picture of what we know by now about shortcuts. So as we said, a D shortcut is a set of edges that reduces the diameter to at most D. And we have the following trade-off for quite a long time. For any parameter d, one can compute a d shortcut with n over d square many edges. And if we just take d to be square root n, we, we get linear size shortcut. As we said, we have this lower bound example by Essie, which was later improved by Ang and Petty, 
to show that if you want linear size shortcut, the diameter must be at least n to the one over six. And in a very exciting recent breakthrough result, Baldwin and Oppenworth improved this lower bound to n to the one over four. Okay. There are also very interesting lower bounds about matching shortcuts in which we restrict the size of the shortcuts to be linear in the number of uh, edges. Okay. So that was kind of what we knew for um, up to very recently. And in particular, people put most attention on linear shortcuts. Soon I'll say why, but it is like the folklore algorithm that we had for many years. Okay, so suppose we want to compute a linear size shortcut that reduces the diameter to square root n. This is a very simple construction that can do that. What we can do, we can sample every vertex independently with probability roughly one over square root n. That is sample roughly a collection of square root n vertices. And then we can connect all pairs of sample nodes if their edges exist in the transitive closure. Okay, and that's all, right? I mean, at most we have the linear number of uh, edges. I'm going to neglect polylog n factors throughout the entire talk, and I'm putting this tilde notation um, to indicate that. Okay, so let's see why this construction works. Suppose we consider now some U to V shortest pass in G. And if the length of this U to V shortest pass is a small square root N, then there is nothing to do, right? This is the diameter that we want to achieve. But assume otherwise, then we can look at the square root N length prefix of the pass and the square root N length suffix of the pass. And with high probability, one of the sample node in S is the prefix, and one of these nodes is the suffix. And because we added the shortcut edges between sample nodes, if this edge exists in the transitive closure, we get a shortcut, right? So this is a very simple construction that just shows that getting the square root n is easy. And in the same way, you can parameterize it. And for every given parameter d, you can add just n over d square many edges. Any questions about these folklore constructions? <clears throat> okay, good. Okay, so linear shortcuts are very useful. And if we look by now at the state of the art algorithms that we have for reachability, approximate shortest fast computation, in almost any non-sequential model of computation, the parallel model, the distributed model, the dynamic model, all these algorithms use shortcuts in one way or the other, okay? And in particular, linear size shortcuts. And therefore, people really struggle with the question whether it is possible to break the square root n diameter barrier using linear number of shortcuts. Okay, so last year, we, we showed a new construction that shows the following. Indeed, one can compute a linear size shortcut that reduces the diameter to enter the one third. Also, you can go below the linear regime. And if you are fine with the square root n diameter that has been obtained so far, in fact, you can achieve it with just sublinear number of n to the server four edges. Our result was more general. We provide a new trade-off between D and the number of edges, which looks as follows. So the interesting threshold point here is n to the one third. If we consider D below n to the one third, we get shortcuts of super linear size that looks as follows. The size bound is n squared over D cubed. And if we look at the regime that D is more than n to the one third, we are in the sublinear regime, and this is the number of edges that we get. And it might be more instructive to look at this function in comparison to the folklore bound that we had. So here on the x-axis, we have d, the d diameter that we want to achieve. And on the y-axis, we have the number of shortcut edges that we had. The, the green curve represents the folklore function, which is n over d squared, right? So in this folklore function, the interesting transition point was square root n. Above it, you are in the sublinear regime, below it, you are in the superlinear regime. And now we have this new function, right? That is made of two functions. Below uh, n to the one third, we get this function, right? This is the superlinear regime, which looks like n over d squared, like the folklore bound over d, which is like a strict improvement. 
And above n to the one third, which is the sublinear regime, we get n over d to the power of three over two, which improves over the square exponent. Okay. So this is the, the new piecewise function that, that we get. Okay. We can also tweak the, the low bound uh, construction of Angen Petty to get some interesting low bounds. For example, for n to the one third, our current upper bound is linear, but the low bound that we get is something like n to the four over five edges. And for square root n, as we said currently, we can get n to the three over four, but the low bound is roughly n to the three over five. Okay, so there are very interesting gaps here, and I'm going to mention the gaps throughout the talk uh, as well. Okay, so the first part of the talk is it's going to just focus on constructing the linear size shortcut with uh, a diameter of n to the one third. At the first part, we are just going to focus on the combinatorial construction. We are going to put aside any computational aspects aside. Later on, we are going to see some efficient, time efficient algorithms for computing these uh, shortcuts. So don't be scared. We are going to do some super lazy steps at that part of the talk, but we will fix it later on. Okay. So our first assumption that we are going to make, which is quite common in, in this area, is that we can assume without loss of generality that the input directed graph that we wish to shortcut is a directed icyclic graph. And here is the reason. Assume that the given graph is just general directed graph. What you can do, you can compute the strongly connected component of your graph. Then you can shortcut every strongly connected component by just adding into the diameter of two, by just adding star edges from some given node into and out each node, okay? So that makes the diameter of every strongly connected component two, and we just add linear number of edges, okay? At that point, we can just contract every strongly connected component, work on the resulting directed icyclic graph, and later on, obtain a solution for the original graph. So note that this reduction is very useful if we are fine with adding linear number of edges. In the problem set that I prepared for after the class, I put an S and exercise, a more general reduction in which you don't need to pay this extra uh, uh, addition of linear number of edges. But for our purpose in this talk, this is fine because at the end, we are good with just a shortcut of linear size and not of sublinear size. Okay, another basic tool that we are going to use is the following. Suppose that the graph, the directed graph that I wish to shortcut is just a path. In such a case, it's super easy to just shortcut the, the diameter to two using roughly near linear number of edges. So here is what one can do. Suppose that this is the D path that I wish to shortcut to diameter of two. We can pick the mid vertex, right? and then add shortcut edges from every vertex in the first half of the path to the mid vertex and from the mid vertex to every vertex in the second half of the path. You see that in this point, I added a linear number of edges and I'm already in a situation where if I have a vertex in the first half of the path and a vertex in the second half of the path, the distance between them is now two. So now I can continue recursively working on each of the paths uh, uh, in parallel, every time I make sure in every independent level of the recursion that whenever two points got separated, I provide them a diameter of two by just adding linear number of edges in every recursion layer. And since the number of layers is log n, this is the number of edges that, that we get. Okay, so we have two tools. We know that we can assume that the graph is a DAG, and we know that if our graph is just a path, then it's very cheap both computationally even, to reduce its diameter to just two. And with these two tools, we are going now to attack the, our general problem, which is as follows. We are given now a DAG, and we want to compute a linear number of shortcut edges whose addition reduces the diameter to roughly n to the one over zero. Okay. So the algorithm is going to have like three steps. The most important step is the first step where we are going to compute a collection of roughly n to the two thirds directed paths 
This directed path are going to be computed in the transitive closure in the graph, not in the original graph itself, but rather in the transitive closure. And this is a very lazy way to compute this collection of n to the two thirds many paths. We look at our transitive closure and we just look for a path, directed path of lengths n to the one third. We find one, we add it to the path collection, we omit all the vertices of this path from the current transitive closure and we continue. So as long as we still find in the remaining transitive closure, a path of lengths n to the one third, we take it out, we add it to the past collection, and we omit all its vertices from the current transitive closure until we are stuck. We look at the remaining transitive closure, and there is no path, directed path of lengths n to the one third in the transitive closure. So at the end of this computation, we get a collection of at most n to the two thirds many directed paths in the transitive closure. And this path of vertex is joined because whenever I compute the path, I omitted all its vertices and then continue in the computation of the next path. Okay. The next step is, is going to consider each of these directed paths that we just computed in the transitive closure. And we are going to compute its two shortcuts. We say that this is very cheap. We just need to add linear number of edges in the length of, of the path. So this is the first set of shortcut edges that we add, okay? And now comes the last step, okay? To look at this last step, let me remind you first the folklore algorithm. The folklore algorithm samples square root n nodes, and it just adds all the possible edges between this collection of square root n nodes. In our algorithm, we kind of have an asymmetric approach where we computed n to the two thirds pass, and we have n nodes, and we are going to subsample a collection of n to the one third d pass and n to the two thirds vertices and add one edge between each pair of directed paths and each node, sampled node. Okay, so more formally, this calligraphic piece, the set of paths that we computed in the first step, and we sample each of these paths with probability roughly one over n to the one third. So overall, we have n to the two thirds, n to the one third directed pass sampled. And we also sample every vertex with probability one over n to the one third. So we have n to the two thirds many vertices. So we have the budget to add one directed edge between every sampled directed pass and a sampled node. And this is the edge that we denote by EVP. Okay, so. Now, the only question is which edge we are going to add to our shortcut set. And this is the edge that we are going to add. So imagine that you have a vertex V and you have a directed path P. We are going to consider the first vertex on the directed path that has a path from V to that vertex. Okay, so this is the first reachable vertex from V on that path. And this is the edge EVP. Why do we want to add this edge? For the following reason. Suppose I give you the path V, the path P and the vertex V. By adding just this edge EVP, one can recover all the reachability relations between V and all the vertices on the path P, right? By adding this edge, you know that there is a directed path from V to any vertex that comes after the yellow vertex on the path, and you know that there is no directed path from V to any vertex that come before the yellow vertex. So here is an illustration of the algorithm. Here we have this collection of paths that we computed in the first step, and the red ones are those that got sampled. We have at most n to the one third many sampled D paths, and here we have the collection of all the vertices, and again the red ones are those that got sampled. We have at most n to the two thirds, and for every sampled vertex, we just look, and every sampled path, we look at the first, the edge to the first reachable vertex on that path and at this edge, okay? So this is the entire algorithm, okay? So let me recap and, and then I'll be happy to, to get some questions. At the first step, as we said, we compute a collection of directed paths 
in the transitive closure, those pass are vertex disjoint, right? The second step computes the first set of shortcuts edges simply by computing the two shortcuts of each of the paths. We can we are, we are going to recap the algorithm and do some size analysis along the way, right? So because the paths are vertex disjoint and we know that the two shortcut, the size of the two shortcut is linear in the size of the paths, the total number of edges that we add to H1 is linear. And finally, in the last step, we are going to subsample out of this path collection that we computed in the first step, only into the one third many paths. And we are going to subsample into the two thirds many vertices. And then we're just going to add to H2 one edge between every sample vertex and every sampled bus. Again, this is in contrast to the folklore algorithm that adds one edge between every sampled node and every sampled node. Here we compute into the two thirds pass that kind of compress the number of nodes in an asymmetric way and adding one edge between a sampled vertex to a sampled node. And because we have into the one third directed pass into the two thirds many vertices, overall we just add linear number of edges in that part as well. And the final shortcut set is the union of H1 and H2. Okay, so this summarizes just this one slide, the, the entire algorithm. Uh, and if there are any questions about the algorithm, I'd be happy to, to take. Okay, good. So now, so now let's move on to the diameter argument because we are already relaxed that the size is good. Okay, and to do the diameter argument, it is instructive to look at the U, some UV shortest path that I am going to call it Q in the graph G union H1. Okay, so I'm considering the shortest path, not in the final graph G union H, but only after adding the set, the first set of shortcut edges, okay, H1, which is the union of two shortcuts of each of the paths, okay. So here is kind of an imaginary uh, argument that I'd like to obtain, okay. There's going to be some mistake in the, in the argument as I'm going to state it now, but this will be like our goal to fix this uh, mistaken argument, okay. So let's consider this U to be shortest path in G union H1. If the length of this path is roughly n to the one third, then we are happy and there is nothing to do. Otherwise, we are going to look at the something like n to the one third length suffix, prefix of this path and roughly n to the one third suffix of this path, okay, with some constants. So by chain of bound, because we sample every vertex with probability roughly one over n to the one third, with high probability, just like in the folklore algorithm, I'm going to see some sampled vertex in the prefix of the path. Let's call it. Now what I'd like to claim also, that if you look at the suffix of the path, with high probability, there's going to be at least one sampled path that intersects this suffix, say at some point W, okay? Now, this is something that we need to show that indeed holds, but suppose that it holds, suppose that I look at the suffix of the path and I see that it intersects with some of the sampled paths in P prime, then I claim that the argument, diameter argument can be completed. Why? Because I know that the algorithm added some edge between a sampled node Z to a sampled path, in this case PI, to the first reachable vertex. It can be W, but if it's not, maybe it's some vertex X that becomes before W. And in such a case, I'm going to have a shortcut pass that goes from U to Z, goes through this shortcut edge that I added to the second set of shortcut edges, traveling to W and finishing. So overall, I get a pass of length roughly n to the one third. So the main goal is really to show that if you look at the suffix of the pass, of the shortest path, it's going to intersect one of the sampled paths. And a priori, it's not clear why this should, this should hold. For example, it might be the case that if you look at the suffix of this path, 
none of them belong to any of the paths that we computed in the first step. It can also be the case that if you look at the suffix of the path, of this shortest path, maybe all the vertices on this path belong to some directed path that I computed in the first step. And because I sampled this path with small probability, maybe it doesn't eat any of the sampled path. So this will be our goal now, kind of to fix this imaginary argument. Okay, so we are going to do that in a sequence of two claims. The first claim is going to say as follows. If we look at just the past collection that we computed in the first step, it kind of covers all the vertices that I kind of see now on the shortest path. In particular, if you look at the shortest path, Q, from U to V, it can contain at most end of the one third vertices that do not belong to the collection of past collection computed in the first step. So let's see why, assume that this doesn't hold. And here I drew in red all the vertices that do not belong to the past collection computed in the first step, okay? I want to say that the number cannot be more than n to the one third. Suppose otherwise, then what we get is that there is some path in the transitive closure that doesn't go through any of the paths that I computed. And this is kind of contradiction to the maximality of the past collection, right? Because we stopped at the point that we look at the remaining transitive closure and there is no such pass. And this is exactly the point where you see why it was important to compute the past collection in the transitive closure because then you can claim this covering property. Even if you have a sequence of red vertices that are not consecutive on your shortest path, it implies that they are connected by a directed path in the transitive closure and by the maximality of the computation, we get a contradiction. So if there is no question, I, I'll move now to the next. Okay, so this kind of tells us that the past collection we, that we computed until we, we get a transitive closure, that the remaining transitive closure has no short pass of lengths into the one third, has good covering properties. We can look at the pass and say, okay, we can neglect like all the vertices that are not covered because their number is small, is roughly n to the one third, okay? The second claim wants to say the following. Now we can kind of be in a situation that almost all the vertices on the suffix that we see belongs to paths computed in the first step, okay? We want to claim that we are not going to see too many representatives from a given pass on our suffix. In particular, we want to claim the following. If we look at our shortest pass Q, and any pass P computed in the first step, there's going to be at most three many vertices in the intersection, okay? So from any pass computed in the first step, we are going to see at most three many vertices on any shortest pass. And here's the reason. So let's consider some pass P computed in the first step, and let's look at this pass Q. And let's assume trot contradiction that we are going to see at least three orange vertices, vertices that comes from the past B. I want to claim that these uh, four vertices coming from the past B, and I want to claim that this cannot be the case. And here is the reason. We say that UV, that is Q, is a shortest path in G union H1. And we know that we added to H1 a two shortcut of the past B. So we know that the distance between, the shortest path distance between U prime and V prime should be at most two. So we cannot have, be in a situation that the shortest path is three. Okay, so this is the contradiction to the, the fact that we added a two shortcut for each of the paths. And here we heavily exploit the fact that our graph is a dog, right? Because if we look at the path P and we added a two shortcut, to make the distance between U prime and V prime at most two, if we look at any shortest path, 
it must be the case that u prime appeals before v prime, they appear in the same order as they appear on the pass p that we computed, okay. So we just, these two claims, we can complete the diameter argument by showing the following, okay? So we know that Q has very few vertices, the shortest path Q between U to V that we want to now analyze, has very few vertices that are not covered by the collection of past collection. And that means that if I look at this suffix Q2, most of the vertices there belong to past computed in the first step, okay? The second claim says that you cannot see more than three representative from each of these given paths, okay? And that means that this path must intersect many distinct paths in the past collection. And finally, we can use Chernoff and say, well, each of these paths got sampled with probability of roughly one over n to the one third, and with high probability, it must intersect one of the sample paths, okay? So this is exactly the claim that we wanted to show. We wanted to look at the suffix and to say, it has many, many representative or many different paths computed in the first step. One of them got sampled with high probability, and therefore we have this saving edge connecting a sampled node to a sampled path, okay? So this completes the, the diameter uh, bound. If you have any questions, then you can. Okay. Oh, there's, there's one question. Sure. Uh, could you go to the previous slide? Yeah. Oh, one more. Sure. Okay, I think she just wanted to take a picture. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, there's one more question. <laughs> Sorry, what happened? Yeah, the definition. Okay, thank you, Okay, I think we're all set. Okay, good. Um, okay, so that was like the size analysis, and now let's kind of look and do some math and see why exactly this is the bound that we get with this construction. So suppose the desired diameter that we want to achieve is just some parameter D, okay? By our construction, we know that we need to compute roughly N over D many D paths in the transitive closure, why? Because we want to be in a situation where at the end of the computation, if we look at the remaining transitive closure, there is no pass of length at most D in the pass. And because this pass or vertex is joined, we need roughly N over D many D pass, okay? That kind of determine, uh, determine the number of D pass that we have in our construction, okay? But then we suppose that this is the number of D pass that we get, we then look at a D length suffix and we sampled N over D many nodes, right? We want to sample every node with probability one over D. And we also want to sample any D pass with probability one over D. So overall we get N over D squared many D pass and N over D sample nodes. And now our algorithm added one edge between every sample D pass and every sample node. So overall the number of edges that we get, sorry, this should be N square, right? N square over D cubed edges, right? And plus n, right? And if we just uh, make it equal n, we get that d, right? If we want a linear number of uh, edges, we get that d becomes n to the one third, okay? So this is the computation that, that we do. And in general, you can be in a situation that you get a shortcut of size n squared over d cubed plus n, okay? 
So now it's very tempting to, to look at this construction and say the following. We have the folklore algorithm that was a symmetric approach. It only works with nodes, it samples nodes, and then it connects each pair of sampled nodes, right? We have our approach, which is kind of asymmetric. It computes a collection of n over d many d paths, but then it connects sampled n over d square many d paths with n over d nodes. How about having making this approach also symmetric and have a d pass on d pass construction in the following sense? Maybe we can just look at the n over d square many sampled d pass times n over d square d pass and just add one edge between two pairs of sample d pass instead of pairs of sample d pass and nodes. Okay. So if we do that, we are going to get, again, I have this typo, it should be n square over d to the four plus n many edges. And this bound is very exciting because this bound is now tight, okay? <laughs> so if this construction would work based on the exciting result by uh, uh, Baldwin and open walls, this would provide us a linear size shortcut with diameter being n to the one to the four, okay? And again, this is like an imaginary picture when it can work. We can just look at the d length suffix and say, well, by the same argument that we said before, it's going to intersect one of the sample paths. And also the suffix is going to intersect one of the sample paths, right? Suffix and prefix are symmetric. But then if we are lucky, maybe we added an edge between one edge between p, j, and p, i, and then we are good because we have this shortcut pass going from U to Z using the shortcut edge between Y and X. And again, we are in a good situation. Okay, so, so that looks like if only we can add one edge to capture the reachability between two sample pass, D pass, then we can get a tight bound for shortcuts and achieve a diameter of n to the one four which now we know that it is tight. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, this doesn't work for the following reason. When we look at this analysis between vertex and d pass, there was a very useful property that we can capture the reachability relations between a given vertex and all the vertices on a given d pass by adding just one edge, the edge from v to the first reachable vertex on the pass. But this doesn't work when you consider two d paths. That is, it might be the case that if you consider two d paths, say p1 and p2, and you want to capture all the reachability relations between their vertices, possibly you need to add linear number of shortcut edges because of the following bad configuration. Imagine that these are the reachability relations. U1 goes to V1 u2, there is a directed path to v2, from u3 to v3, etc. If you just omit this edge, right, and you don't take it into your structure, then there is no way to capture the reachability from u3 to v3, to, from u3 to v3, right? Even if you had all pink edges, this still doesn't indicate the fact that in the original graph, there is a directed path from u3 to v3. Okay, so to capture reachability between d pass, this you cannot in general compress, and you just need to add linear number of edges and not a single edges. We add in this wishful counting, and this is why we are still far from obtaining this uh, holy grail bound of n to the one over four. Any questions about this example? Oh, yes, there's a question. Okay, good. This might be better as an offline question, but uh, there's nothing saying that uh, the two paths or the two sets of sample paths have to have the same thing. So is it worth trying to, uh, for example, one set of smaller paths and one set of larger paths? So, so like sort of an extreme case of that was the vertex and path pair. But is there any reason to not try asymmetric sizes of paths? Uh, 
that you have, you would then have uh, the length of the shorter paths, many edges to capture all the resources. Okay. Is that work? Should I repeat the question? Yeah, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so the question is um, whether it would make sense to consider near for the beginning of the path and the end of the path two different lengths of, of paths. Like right now, they're all the same length of path. But mm -hmm. in the original version of the algorithm, it was the extreme case where one side was vertices and one side was paths. So the question is about whether it makes sense to like consider different lengths of paths. So the length of the path is not really um, a, a reason to worry about because you can only always imagine that the short you can two shortcut each of these paths right to make the length to be roughly two even right. So the barrier is not really in the length of the path, even if these paths are longer or shorter. This is not our barrier, even if it was longer. Recall that we add a two shortcut edges a two shortcut edges for each of these paths. The main limitation is how to compress the number of nodes in this graph. We can compress them by computing the small number of d paths, but then we need to do this asymmetric uh, uh, adding of shortcut edges because of the fact that we can encode reachability cheaply between a vertex and a path and not between pairs of uh, d paths. I think one way to go is kind of look at this um, configuration that I just drew. When I tried to play with it and take it to the extreme, I got graph structures for which I could easily provide linear side shortcuts, okay? Um, so kind of understanding these bad configurations in which you are forced to add many linear, a linear number of edges to capture reachability, at least my impression that in these configurations that there should be maybe other strategies to shortcut and then to handle the remaining cases in which you can actually easily compress reachability between pairs of paths by you adding small number of edges. So it's really how to efficiently compress reachability between pairs of paths and how to handle different configurations. At least this is my understanding. You can also follow up offline afterwards. Okay, I think we're all set. Okay, good. Um, okay, so so far I told you that we should uh, really put aside computational aspects, but the truth is that shortcuts has like lots of applications, especially in computational settings. So at the end of the day, we want to compute a linear size shortcut very fast in the distributed, parallel, dynamic settings. And, and we are going to show some baby steps uh, towards this goal, right? Uh, in the sequential setting, okay? Um, and to do that, let's recap again the key steps of the algorithm, but now we are putting the glasses of computational time, okay? So we had this first step of the algorithm, which was the most, the heaviest computationally of computing this collection of n to two thirds many d paths, that was heavy computationally in the sense that it, we did it very tediously. We look at the transitive closure. That means that first I need to compute the transitive closure, and then repeatedly kind of finding the longest pass in this transitive closure until I end up with a remaining transitive closure that doesn't have large pass, long pass. Then we have the second step that we were quite happy about, in which we two shortcut each of the paths, and this is very efficiently, this can be done in linear time. And lastly, we had the third step of the algorithm that we had to add these edges between n to the one third many directed paths and n to the two thirds many uh, vertices. And this can be done computationally by kind of solving single source reachability with respect to n to the one third many d paths, so this takes something like n to the one third times m time. I'm going to comment about that step later on, but at least when we look at the picture at this point, the step that we should be most worried about is the first step, right? This is like the key barrier to go below n to the omega, the computation time of, uh, the computation time here is, is kind of slow, okay. So let's formalize like the key algorithmic step that we wish to uh, obtain. 
which is as follows. Our goal is to compute a pass collection that has n to the two thirds many d paths. This d paths should be in the transitive closure, and they should satisfy two important properties that are important for our analysis. The first one is that we require this d paths to be vertex disjoint. This is important because later on we are going to add a two shortcut for each of the d paths. So for the size analysis, we want them to be vertex disjoint. And the second property is kind of covering property. We want to look at every directed pass in G and say that at most n to the one third the vertices are not covered, do not belong to this union of pass of vertices on this pass collection. And that was important for our diameter argument, which allows us only to focus on vertices that belong to this collection of directed paths. Okay. So it is a very clean, but still costly approach to compute this pass collection, not in a naive way, but rather in n to the omega time. And this is based on the notion of chain and anti-chain decomposition that I'm going to define. So a chain is just a fancy name to say a directed pass in the transitive closure. And an anti-chain is an independent set in the transitive closure. And there is a well-known decomposition of a directed, a directed acyclic graph that decomposes the DAG into chain and anti-chain in the following way. For every given DAG, you can decompose its vertices into two parts, a collection of n to the two thirds chains, which are directed paths in the transitive closure, and our vertex disjoint. This sounds great, right? And n to the one third anti-chains such that if you look at the union of all the vertices in the chain part and in the end of the one third anti-chains collection of independent sets, okay, this covers all the vertices. Now I want to claim that if we just apply this chain and anti-chain decomposition and we take the chain part, okay, as our past collection, this satisfies all the properties that we want, okay? So in particular, the number is good, right? That we are getting n to the two thirds vertex disjoint chains. I just need to show you the covering property that now if you look at any directed pass in G, it's going to have at most n to the one third vertices that are not covered by the chains that is that belong to the part of the anti-chain. And here is the reason. By the definition of anti-chain, right? If you look at the directed pass, you are going to see at most one vertex from every anti-chain. Because if you have two vertices from the same anti-chain, they are all connected in the transitive closure, so they cannot be in the same independent set. And because we know that if you look at the subset of vertices that are not covered by the chain, they are decomposed into n to the one third anti-chains, we know that there are at most n to the one third many vertices that do not belong to the chain, okay? So if we just take the construction of chain and anti-chain decomposition, the chain part just satisfies all the covering properties that we want to obtain, and we don't need to repeatedly compute this collection and exhaustively look for this uh, longest pass in the, in the DAG. Okay. So this provides us with a very fast, we kind of faster implementation of step one. We can compute the transitive closure of the graph in n to the omega time by matrix multiplication. And then we can just apply the, the, the existing algorithm by Gradoni et al for chain and anti-chain decomposition in n square time. And by that we get just a shortcut algorithm that runs in n to the omega time. But this is still not very good. And the reason is that, that if you allow a computation of transitive closure, it's kind of trivialized many of the applications that we, con we consider when working with shortcuts, right? Usually with shortcuts, we want to compute single source reachability. We want to solve various reachability problems. We want to do that in much less than n to the omega time. So our first challenge was to do it in less than n to the omega time, and that means that we want to compute this collection of paths in the transitive closure without explicitly computing the transitive closure. And that was, it's going to be now our next goal. 
Any question at this point about this chain and anti-chain decomposition and why it provides the past collection? Uh, yes. Could you repeat how anti-chains are used here? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so the anti-chain are only important for the sake of the analysis, right? Because we are going to compute the chain and anti-chain decomposition, but we are only going to use the chain part as the pass collection, right? The number is good, it's n to the one, it's n to the two thirds, they are vertex disjoint. But now I want to show in the analysis that it also satisfies the second covering property. That now, if you look at every directed pass in G, it's going to contain at most n to the one third vertices that are not covered by the chains. Because of the chain anti chain decomposition, we know that all the vertices that are not covered by the chains can be ordered in n to the one third sets. Each of these sets is an independent set, right? And then we want to claim that there can be at most n to the one third many vertices that do not belong to the chain. And here we use the fact that on every pass, you are going to see at most one vertex from each independent set, right? Because if there are two vertices, say these two uh, yellow vertices, that belong to the same independent set, we get a contradiction because we know that these nodes are connected by an edge in the transitive closure, right? So along the path, you're going to see at most one representative from each of the anti-chains. And because there are at most n to the one third sets of anti-chains, we are going to see at most n to the one third many vertices that are not covered by the chains. Okay, so we only use it for the analysis to claim that the covering property of the chains is good, is satisfied. Okay, are we good? Yes. Oh, one more question. Sure. Can you say that one more time? So how do you know that any path in G contains at most n to the one third vertices from from the anti chain from the anti chains? Yeah, just because just because of counting, we know that all the vertices that are not on the chains they can be partitioned into n to the one third sets. Each of these sets is an anti-chain, right? And we know that on this path, you cannot see two representative vertices from the same anti-chain because anti-chain is an independent set and two vertices on a path are connected in the transitive closure. So each of the vertex, each of the yellow vertex that you see must belong to a distinct anti-chain, to a distinct independent set. And there are at most n to the one third independent sets. So then how do you know you can do chain and anti-chain decomposition? Yeah, this is just a, a result that, that we have, okay? So this is a well-known result that says that for every graph, you can decompose, if, you, if I give you a DAG, right? In our case, the graph is a DAG and also the transitive closure is a DAG. You can, you can partition the vertices of the DAG into two subsets. One of the set can be partitioned into a collection of n to the two third chains. The remaining one can be partitioned into n to the one third anti-chain. So this is kind of a black box result that we take. It's more general for any parameter D, you can partition it into n, n over d many chains and d many anti-chains. So this is a result that has been known and has been studied by Grandoni et al. And by just taking the chain part of their algorithm, we can, we can show that this is, this is good. Thank you, I think we're all set. Sure, okay, good.
Okay, so, so this brings us to the end of the omega, and now we want to see how can we go below n to the omega just to make some sense in our construction, right? Okay, so, so the first step that we did along this line was to use a reduction to the mean cost max flow problem, okay? And our first algorithm that I'm going to see some high level intuition for that provided us with a randomized algorithm for computing the desired shortcuts and the running time looks something as follows. M times n to the one third. This is the time that it takes just to add the edges between the sampled pass and the sampled vertices. But the first step of computing the pass collection can be implemented in the times that it takes to solve a mean cost max flow instance plus n to the slow level two, okay? We can also show that this term of m times n to the one third is computationally necessary. I'm going to say maybe something about it later on. So the main bound that we get is the time to compute mean cost max flow plus n to the slow level two. The, at the time of having this algorithm, the state of the art algorithm for mean cost max flow algorithm was roughly m times n to the slow level two. So we weren't that bothered by this extra n to the slow level two term that we add here. But then soon after publication, we realized that there was this breakthrough result by uh, Chan et al that provide an almost linear time algorithm for the mean cost max flow. And that pushes us kind of to omit this extra n to the silver two term and get something of the form m times n to the one third plus the time to compute a mean cost max flow algorithm. Okay. So now I'm just going to show you like the high level idea of what's the connection between the past collection that we wish to compute without computing the transitive closure and a mean cost max flow uh, instance. Okay. So here's the high level idea. What we are going to do in that algorithm is that for technical reasons, first we are going to shortcut our graph to diameter of square root n by adding linear number of edges. We know that this can be done now in linear time or almost linear time by JLS. So this step is cheap, but at least after adding this number, this shortcut edges H0, I know that the diameter of my graph is square root n, but I still want to reduce it to n to the one third. Okay, so I, I still have things to do. Okay. Then we are going to solve our key task not on G, but, this, but rather on this augmented graph, G union H0. And we are going to do that by having a reduction to a mean cost max flow instance. I call it the partial reduction because the time that it takes to implement the second step is not the time to only to compute the mean cost max flow, but there is this extra end of the struggle to additive term that I must pay regardless of the time to compute the mean cost max flow instance. So the reduction at that point was not clean, okay? So this is our goal. And here it how it looks like. We look at this augmented graph, G union H0, okay? And then we solve a mean cost max flow instance by adding a super node S and a super source T. And we are going to send roughly n to the two thirds units of flow from the super node, okay? Once we solve the mean cost max flow instance, we are going to do a flow decomposition that will provide us a collection of n to the two thirds many paths in this instance G prime. So G prime is some transformed instance that I'm going to show you. And this collection of n to the two thirds D paths are not necessarily vertex disjoint. As you can see, they can overlap. Then I can translate this path in G prime into pass in my original graph, G union H0, right? Which is the augmented graph. And again, get pass that have some possible overlap, but at the very last step, I can transform them into a collection of vertex disjoint chains. And this can be done in a brute force manner. You just look at the collection of pass that you get. And in time that depends on the total length of the pass here, you just compute uh, or uh, uh, translate them 
into vertex disjoint chains, right? You iterate over the paths and whenever you see a path, a node that has already been observed, you can kind of jump and compute a chain. So moving from paths to vertex disjoint chains, this takes something that is linear in the total length of the path. And the reason why we don't have at this point a clean mean cost max flow reduction is because after computing this flow decomposition, the total length of the path that we get here is n to the over two. So just to move from this step to this step takes us this extra additive term. Okay, so I'm going to say it in more details now. So first I want to, to give some, some idea about how the mean cost max flow instance looks like. As we said, we are going to add this super node, super source node S and another dummy node S prime, which we need. And we are going to send n to the two thirds unit of flow through this source node S. And we also add a dummy target sync node T. So in the min cost max flow instance, every edge is going to identify parameterized by a cost function C and by a capacity function U. And this is what we do. We take every node VI in the graph and we represent it by a gadget of three vertices that looks as follows. The, we have, are going to have three copies for a node, VI in, VI out. This is standard usually in transformation that we do in, uh, in a mean cost uh, max flow transformation. But we also add this prime node, V prime I. And this gadget is connected as follows. There is a directed edge from the in to the out. It has capacity of one, okay? But the cost of this edge is super negative, is minus n cubed, okay? This will force our mean cost max flow algorithm to cover as many as distinct vertices as possible in the collection of paths that we have in our flow, just by setting the cost yield to be super negative, okay? Also, there is an edge that has a very large capacity, but of zero cost connecting S prime and T. So that means that when we ship all the flows, all the, all the units of flow from S to T, all, and we compute a mean cost max flow instance, all the paths are going to have non-positive cost because we can always send everything through the zero cost path, okay? And lastly, for every edge between VJ and VI in our graph, we just connect the out copy of J into the in copy of E, of uh, I. Okay, so also this is standard. We have two copies of in and out, and all the outgoing edges are going from the out copy to the in copy of the other vertex. The main new thing is having this gadget that if you want to go from in to out, you can go through the I prime, but this will cost you one unit and there is infinite capacity here. Or otherwise, you can go directly on this edge and this is only one capacity, but it has an extra lower cost. So you always want to use this edge as much as possible, okay? So when you look at these properties of this flow instance, we get a collection of n to the two thirds d pass when you look at the, the flow decomposition of the solution. And in addition, if you look at the flow solution, we are going to see that for every vertex VI, there's going to be at most one pass that contains this edge from in to out. And because this edge has a super negative cost, the optimal solution will try to maximize the number of covered edges. So by we are going to have the good covering properties simply by forcing our mean cost max flow algorithm to cover as many vertices as possible, okay? So I, I want to, to also cover other topics. So I'm going to kind of jump to the most up-to-date algorithm that we currently have these days in which we can solve kind of the key problem in a pure mean cost max flow time. And this is the state of 
the hard bound that we currently have, we can compute the linear size shortcut in this time, m times n to the one third, which is conditionally necessary if you assume the BMM, the Boolean matrix multiplication conjecture, plus the time to solve a mean cost max flow. And the way that this new algorithm works is by taking a somewhat different approach that one than what we had before. So far, we really focused on computing a collection of n to the two third chains that have a very strong covering property. We wanted to make sure that if we look at every directed pass, there's going to be at most n to the one third vertices that are not covered. This strong covering property led to this running time with this extra n to the three over two term. To get rid of that, we then look at more relaxed problem. Suppose that now our goal is not to reduce the diameter of the graph to enter the one third in one shot, but rather just by a constant factor. I'm given a graph, I want to add a linear number of edges that reduces the diameter by a constant factor. If I do that for long and many steps, I'm getting to the final bound. This allows us to define a more relaxed covering requirements, okay? that allows us to solve the problem in time, which is mean cost max flow without this extra additive term of n to the three over two. Okay, but it also calls for a new diameter analysis than the one that I showed you before, but it has also the benefit of providing a kind of a unified algorithm that can handle any given diameter and give you the state of the art algorithm. So with this approach, of reducing the diameter in log in many steps, where in every step you are given some graph with diameter d, you just want to compute a linear number of edges that reduces the diameter by a constant factor. This allows you to define a relaxed notion of pass that we call diameter dominating pass, which can be computed in linear time. I just say something about the relaxed covering properties of this pass they have the following property. Instead of requiring that every pass has at most a fixed number of n to the one third vertices that are not covered by the pass, here we are good with having an uncovered fraction of vertices. That is, it is sufficient to provide us with the following situation, that if you look at any shortest pass of lengths roughly d over eight, at most a constant fraction, at least a constant fraction of the past will be covered, okay? So this constant fraction, this is the main thing in the relaxation of the covering property that allows us to solve it in a clean mean cost max flow reduction. And let me jump here. The only difference to get this improved algorithm is that instead of putting on this flow instance, a very strong polyno minus polynom negative polynomial cost on the edge from in to out, here we have just minus constant, okay? This allows us to solve the instance now in min cost max flow time, get a collection of paths of linear size and get a min cost max flow, a clean min cost max flow reduction. So it's, it is the difference between minus seven and minus n to the cube that really affect the algorithm to get the state of the art bound and get a mean cost max flow reduction plus the additive term of m times n to the one third, which is kind of needed. Okay, so let me wrap up the computational aspects. I know that I, I it was kind of fast, but I really want to go to the application part to give a taste of, of another uh, part of the work. So we started with the most naive algorithm that runs roughly in n to the eight over three, just by iteratively finding, finding a long pass in the remaining transitive closure. Then we said we can solve the problem, the key task in n to the omega time by using this chain and anti-chain decomposition. Then we said, okay, we can provide a partial reduction to the mean cost max flow problem and have this extra n to the three over two term. And finally, we are in a situation that we can solve it in a, clean mean cost max flow time and having this extra term, which is the time to implement the last step of the algorithm of connecting n to the one third many d pass 
and enter the through through these many vertices. And the main open problem is really to provide a linear time algorithm, which kind of most likely uh, call for, for new techniques, because at least in our algorithm, conditionally on the Boolean matrix multiplication, this running time is, is probably tight. So any, any question on the high level ideas of the computational aspects? How can we expect to be linear time? Uh, if, if there's the conditional lower bound of M times M to the one third, then how can we expect to get linear time? Sure. That's a great question. So if we actually consider the folklore algorithm, right, that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we said that we sample square root n many vertices, and then we just, you know, connect every pair. The naive or combinatorial way to do that, right, is just to compute square root n single source shortest path, right? And this requires, based on the Boolean matrix multiplication, square root n times m time. However, by now we have another algorithm that uses a completely different approach, right, by JLS that can implement the folklore algorithm, but in a complete different manner and provide an almost linear time algorithm. For example, in the almost linear time algorithm that we have for square root n shortcut, what you do is you have this recursive approach where at every point you sample constant number of nodes that you look at pivot and you compute single source searchability only with respect to these pivots, and then you partition your problem into several parts, depending on the reachability relations to these pivots. For example, all the vertices that are reachable to the pivots are in one class, all the vertices that ever pass from the pivot are in different class, all the vertices that are not related to the pivot, and you just continue recursively. So, just in the way that we have a completely different algorithm that has the same bounds as the folklore algorithm, it's very hard to see any similarity between these two algorithms and yet to obtain the same square root n shortcut bound, it might be the case that there is a completely different algorithm that doesn't use this approach that we just showed and provide a linear time algorithm, but it must, Heavily use some different type of approach or some other way to compute this, um, uh, these connections of things, but it would not implement the algorithm that I mentioned. At least for the algorithm that I mentioned, this time bound is kind of uh, conditionally tight and providing a linear time algorithm is super interesting, but probably needs to, to use some different type of approach. Okay, no more questions for now. Okay, good. Um, so in the kind of last, I, I guess, 15 minutes, right? I, I'm going to discuss some applications of offsets or shortcuts, okay? Um, and see how we can use shortcuts, offsets. I'm going to define soon what is offsets. It's closely related to shortcuts to get new graph structures, okay? Um, and this is based on our uh, work in uh, Fox last year. So in the very high level in network design, we usually have like two classes of problems. The first class is what we discuss these days, this uh, talk is augmentation problem. I'm given a graph G and I'd like to augment it with extra edges H in order to optimize some graph parameter in G union H, right? This is exactly the notion of shortcuts. I'm adding extra edges to my graph so that if I look at G union H, I optimize some parameter, say the diameter, okay? Now there is another class of problems, which is specification. Here our goal is completely different. I want to sparsify the graph, not to add edges. I want to sparsify the graph and remove as many as edges as possible to get a graph H that still approximates well some properties from the original graph. So in both of these augmentation and specification, the objective is kind of different, right? In the first one, we add edges 
in the adult we remove, but still the main combinatorial question is how to optimize the size versus the quality of the structure that we compute, right? Both in augmentation, we want H to be small and also in specification. So the trade-off is kind of similar, but the objective are different. And what we can show using shortcuts and the related notion of offsets is that one can have a black box transformation from algorithms that augment your graph, okay, and satisfies the property pi into new specification problems. That is, we can use shortcuts in order to provide new uh, uh, subgraphs that preserve properties in the original graphs, which kind of looks surprising because the objectives are, are so different. So now let's look at some examples. Another example for a problem that, an augmentation problem is what we called offset. So offset is very related to shortcuts. I'm going to define it soon, but in the very high level, the goal is to augment your graph with few edges in order to reduce the number of ops, that is edges, on approximate shortest path, okay? And a very uh, well-known example for specification problem is that of spanners. In spanner, we want to remove edges from the graph in order to obtain a sparse of graphs that approximates well the distances. So both offsets and spanners has to do with approximation of distances and we want to optimize the size, right? And in our work, we kind of have now a new reduction that given offsets, we can get spanners, okay? Another example for sparsified uh, graphs uh, are those of preservers, okay? In preservers, one is given a collection of pairs, P, and the goal is to output a sparse subgraph H so that it approximates well all the distances between the pairs. That is for every pair UV, the distance in H is at most say T, the distance between this pair in G. And our approach also allows us that to take offsets and translate them in a black box manner into structures that are distance preservers, okay? So we use the fact that both of them try to optimize the size and the approximation, but in some, I, I would say surprising way, we take output of offsets that augment the graph and provide new uh, sparsified, sparse subgraphs for uh, some relevant problems. Okay, so let me just define the notion of offset, which is very related to that of shortcut. So one can think about offsets as being shortcuts plus some distance guarantees in the following way. In the setting of offsets, we are given a possibly weighted and directed graph. And then we consider the weighted transitive closure where every edge from U to V is weighted by the shortest path from U to V in the graph, okay? And then an important notion is the bounded hop distance, okay? So we say that the bounded hop distance DG beta, okay? is computed as follows. You look at all the shortest paths between U and V that have at most beta hops. You take the length of the shortest one, length by edges, and this is the D beta UV distance. That is, it's the U to V shortest path when you restrict attention only to paths that have at most beta hops, beta edges, okay? The reason why we care about this bounded hop is that when you compute single source shortest pass, the depth of the computation, right, depends on the length of the shortest pass. And again, we want to minimize the depth and therefore one is desired to take the graph G and to augment it with few weighted edges in order to reduce the diameter of the shortest pass tree, in order to reduce the number of ops of shortest pass. So it's very related to shortcuts, but it also adds some distance guarantees. If you want to solve reachability, you need to use offsets, a shortcut. If you want to solve shortest path, you need to use this uh, offset uh, set, okay? So formally, a one plus epsilon beta offset is a set of edges taken from the weighted transitive closure that satisfies the following 
if you look at the better hope distances in the augmented graph G union H, it provides you a one plus epsilon approximation to the true distances in G. Or in other words, if you now look at G union H and you do, you apply single so shortest pass up to depths of beta, this is good enough. Up to one plus epsilon stretch, you're going to report the right uh, uh, distances from, uh, from S, okay? So it has many applications in shortest pass computation, one plus epsilon beta, okay? So what do we know about this one plus epsilon beta offsets? Well, we have kind of good bounds, especially in the undirected setting. The thing to know that in this slide is that handling weights in offset is always easy in the sense that it is handled almost in the same manner as unweighted setting, okay? So in the weighted undirected graphs, we can have the following bound. For whatever parameter k, you can provide op bound of beta with this number of edges. For example, you can provide op bound, which is n to the little of one with just linear number of edges. For directed graphs, a very, Nice result, interesting result by Bernstein and Vine in the last soda provide the same bound that we have for reachability shortcut now for a one plus epsilon shortcut. So with beta being n to the one third, you can provide linear side shortcuts and whatever you have for shortcuts, you can in fact provide now with one plus epsilon uh, beta uh, offset. Okay. And there are also some lower bound results. So the, the bottom line of this slide is to say, in directed graphs, in, in four offsets, we can handle good weights. And we can also handle directed graphs in the sense that we can go below the quadratic bound. We can have efficient constructions even in the directed set. Okay. Now we move to the analog structure in the specification world, okay, not in the augmentation, in which we also have two parameters, one plus epsilon and beta but kind of in different meaning. And this has to do with spanners. So a one plus epsilon beta spanner is a subgraph, okay? We can define it in contrast to offset only in the unweighted undirected setting. And this spanner is a subgraph of G that satisfies the following, that if you look at every, the distance in uh, U and V, in, so it should be in H, it's at most, one plus epsilon, the distance in G plus beta, okay? So the interesting thing to note is that for spanners, one near additive spanners, we have kind of the same trade-off between beta and the number of edges as we have for one plus epsilon beta offset. Even though these structures are so different, still we have the same trade-off function between beta and the number of edges, okay? Again, this is what we have for offsets, and this is what we have for spanners, and for the related notion of emulator, which is the set of edges that is not a subgraph, but rather any set of edges. Okay, so this was kind of mysterious, this relation between offsets and spanners, especially despite the fact that both of these structures as the same beta and epsilon parameters, they are very much different. In offsets, beta measures the op bound, the number of edges on shortest pass, whereas in spanners, beta measures the additive stretch. Offsets are very good in handling weighted and directed graphs. We can get very good bounds even in the weighted and the directed setting. However, in spanners, we can do no specification when the graph is weighted and directed. Another thing to notice is that if the graph is sparse, then the spanner problem is trivial. There is nothing to solve. You can just take all the graph and you don't need to sparsify the graph. However, there are examples in which the graph is sparse, but you still need to build a dense offset. And lastly, the question is what's the focus? In offsets, the main focus is in handling distance pairs. If you have pairs that are nearby, they have a small number of hops, so they are solved. You really care about making sure that pairs that are far away in G becomes nearby 
by your op number in the offset. In the spanner is the other way around, right? I mean, you, you mostly care about nearby pairs. So these structures are, are very different. And yet, if you look at the state of the art constructions, we have the same trade of function between epsilon, beta, and the size, even though the meaning of beta is completely different. They have all, almost the same construction. And in fact, if you look at many of the papers on offsets and spanners, usually they have the following form. There is like a section that have the algorithm for spanner. And then you kind of repeat the same thing for offset with small adaptation. And this raises the question of whether one can just provide a black box transformation from offsets to spanners without having this repetition each time again. But of course, this is not trivial because the notion of beta is so uh, different. So I just take some of the results that we have in this context. We kind of have a general reduction scheme that can take any offset construction in a black box manner. We just look at the construction at the output offsets and we can provide new distance preservers and scanners. For example, by using the offset by Bernstein and Vine, we can compute new distance preservers with one plus epsilon approximation that were not known before. By taking for the undirected weighted setting, by taking the one plus epsilon beta offsets, we can provide new distance preservers again uh, and nearly match what we knew for the unweighted setting. So we heavily use the fact that we have offsets in the weighted setting and in the directed setting to provide stronger notions of spanners in those uh, settings as well. Okay, so how much time do I have left uh, now? Uh, like a few minutes. Okay, okay. Um, so I, I think I'll just have like a, a very simple proof that shows this connection between offsets and spanners and shows how to translate the beta bound of op bound into an additive term, okay? And in particular, let me show you the following result. If you are given a one plus epsilon beta offset, okay, and you augment it with a T spanner, what you get is a one plus epsilon T beta spanner with this number of edges, okay? So by taking an offset and a multiplicative spanner, you can just get a near additive spanner. You can convert this beta opbound term into an additive term of the spanner. And I'll prove this result in a simpler setting where I just want to get an emulator. That is a set of edges that are not subgraph of G, but just some sparse graph on the same vertex set and show the following. If I take a one plus epsilon beta offset and I add to it a T multiplicative spanner, one can get a one plus epsilon beta T emulator. So I take a, an augmentation problem and I provide eventually a solution for a specification problem. I take the beta op bound and I translate it into an additive stretch, a small additive stretch. Okay. So, so this, is, this is the claim, right? If you just take an offset and a T multiplicative spanner, you get a near additive emulator, and this is the proof, okay? Just imagine that you consider some uh, U, V pair, right? And consider the U to V shortest pass in the offset, okay? So this is how this pass P looks like, right? It has some edges from the offset, these blue edges, and some edges from the original graph, right? And you know that because this is the offset, the length of this pass is at most one plus epsilon, the distance between U and V, okay? Now, instead of taking, I'm not taking the G edges, right? But I'm covering, because I'm adding a T spanner, every G edge is covered in the T spanner by some pass of length T, okay? And this provides us with the following pass. You can go through, the blue edge, take this T loop, go through the blue edge, 
T loop, etc. But the number of loops that we have is at most better because the number of hops on the P pass is better. So the fact that we have small number of hops means that we have only small number of loops that we are going to travel. And in particular, the distance that we have in the final emulator, which is the offset union, the spanner, is bounded by the length of the pass plus T times beta, right? Because we have at most beta black edges on the pass. But then we know that the length of the pass is at most one plus epsilon, the true distance between U and V plus T beta, and this provides us with the right additive term. So at least in the undirected, unweighted setting, it's very easy to see how small op bound can be translated into a small additive uh, stretch. And this already provides a first order answer to the open problem by El King and, um, and Nima. Okay. So let me just wrap up. There are many other uh, results in that uh, paper. Uh, so I try to show you in this, uh, in this talk, new bounds and new algorithms for shortcuts and offsets. Also note that there is a general transformation that can take reachability shortcuts and offsets in a black box manner and transform them into distance preser preserving uh, subgraphs, okay? And this provides us with new spanner upper bounds, but also with new lower bounds for offsets. There are many interesting open ends, especially in the combinatorial aspects for shortcuts. This is the current gap that we currently have for linear size shortcuts. The upper bound is n to the one third. The exciting lower bound that we now have is n to the one over four. Currently, we only have some interesting constructions, but only in the sequential setting because we are using Minkos max flow algorithms. But it will be very interesting to provide improved time computation in the sequential, distributed, parallel. At the end of the day, the holy grail result is to solve reachability, single source reachability in near linear time and little o of square root n depths, okay? This is something that we currently cannot do because we cannot compute efficiently our n to the one third shortcut fast in the parallel setting, for example. And of course, there are many other interesting problems uh, concerned with the graph theoretic applications, such as providing tighter relations between these two notions of graph specification and graph augmentation. So, uh, I want to end with one problem that was open for a, lo a long time, and I usually state it as an open problem. It has to do with exact directed offsets. So here we want to augment the graph with directed edges, but to preserve distances exactly without having this one plus epsilon approximation. These structures also suffered from the square root n barrier with linear number of edges for uh, many uh, years. And recently in this uh, uh, breakthrough result by Baldwin and Openworth, it was shown that square root n is tight. So at least for exact offsets, square root n is the right answer. But luckily, if you allow one plus epsilon approximation, you can go uh, below that and to the one third and maybe even n to the one fourth. Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. Any more questions? So uh, I wanted to ask about uh, computational ideas to improve the running time of the uh, approximate offset construction, like we did for the short term. Should I repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so um, it's about uh, getting faster algorithm. Do you, getting faster algorithms for approximate hop sets um, because you talk about it yeah. for short <laughs> Yeah, so currently uh, Bernstein and Wine, uh, Nicole can answer that better than myself. Uh, they, they could match the combinatorial bounds, but the algorithms are kind of more involved. 
And it has to do again with this computation of the past collection. The past collection now should also satisfy some additional requirements that call for computing shortest past computation, which makes the computation heavier considerably. In particular, we cannot just use a min cost max flow uh, reduction to solve it. So also providing uh, even n to the omega uh, time algorithm for computing this uh, uh, approximate shortcut is an interesting problem. At that particular offset problem, we are stuck computationally at, uh, at some large polynomial bound and even solving it in n to the omega, as far as I know, should, should be interesting. I agree, it's a good open problem. Okay, let's thank Marav again. Thank you.